Hello and um, welcome to uh, e-lecture six, um, which is part of the ETM 37 additive manufacturing module. Um, in this uh, lecture, we are, are going to be talking about uh, powder feedstock characterization, and it <clears throat> forms two uh, lectures. So e-lecture six and e-lecture seven are both related to powder metals, uh, which if you look in your review notes, you'll find um, the uh, chapter nine on powder metals. We are going to talk in e-lecture six mainly about the characterization of uh, metal powders. So what makes good powder for additive manufacturing? What properties are needed from the powder? So what typical size distributions or of the powder uh, particles themselves? So we need to understand how we characterize a powder first before we can uh, uh, determine what is good for the process. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how particle sizes, how particle size distributions are um, um, uh, characterized. We're going to talk about morphologies of powder particles, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, rheometric properties, flow properties of the powder. And then eventually that will lead us on to some examples of um, how we can determine whether these are good for additive manufacturing. So the key questions are, what, are the, what, what, what makes a good powder? Is it the flowability of the powder? Uh, the size distributions, what size should they be? Should it be 15, 45 microns? Um, what about the powder itself, the particles themselves? Should they be all perfectly spherical? Or is there a distribution of different sizes, spheres? Or indeed, do they have to be spherical at all? Um, Composition itself can be um, uh, is 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 the typical composition that you have for alloys. Is that for standard alloys? Is that applicable for additive manufacturing? We're not going to talk so much about that, but more about the thermal uh, the properties like density of the of the powder and thermal properties of the powder. And we'll come back to these questions at the end of the lecture. So basically, the characteristics of the powder, which I've already alluded to there, are uh, morphology, which essentially means shape um, in Greek, but powder size distributions, often shortened to PSD, the microstructure and chemistry, or the metallurgy of the, the, the alloy itself, the rheology, the flow, the compressibility, um, and how the powder packs. Thermophysical properties, um, and specifically the physical properties such as tap and bulk density and apparent density, and also cost and safety and storage and shelf, shelf life of the powder. These are all characteristics of the powder. What I'm going to focus on primarily in this part uh, is on the morphology, the size distributions, and on the flow um, and um, density um, properties. So the, the way in which the powders are made themselves can affect and does affect very much the, the, the powder. So whether it's produced by mechanical process, um, such as milling, electrolytic processes, or chemical processes, or also physical or atomization type processes, will always have a shape, an effect on the powder. And we're gonna see more about this in the uh, next lecture. Um, but for the time being, we're gonna uh, look at the size, the shape, the microstructure, the chemistry, and the cost of the powder. Here are some examples of some different powder particles um, uh, looked at under the scanning electron microscope. And you can see the, the very different um, morphologies. Uh, so you've got some gas atomized powder there. Uh, you've got uh, some powders which have been produced by uh, crushing, which you can see the very angular, slightly irregular shapes there. You can see very spherical shapes on the right-hand side um, and with monosized distributions. And then you've got these gas atomized powders on the left um, showing satellites and uh, rather, and small to large, but generally very spherical powder shapes, typical of gas atomization. And we're going to see more about these different processes and how they're produced in the next lecture. But for the time being, what we're going to do is just go back to basics and give some of the, um, the terminologies which are used to define particle morphology. 
So uh, we can have a cicula, which are kind of these uh, sliver shaped um, green particles at the, at the top. Um, you can have flaky particles here, uh, which are typical sort of uh, almost two dimensional um, and uh, irregular shapes. We can have rod like um, uh, particles here, which again, rather irregular, but with maybe some uh, some rounded features. And then we have dendritic um, powders, which are typically formed where parts of the uh, crystal growth of the, um, of the actual, uh, during the solidification forms dendrites. Um, these are very two dimensional uh, and the, the, the forms that they take in three dimensions are um, spheres or spherical uh, from atomization. You can have more rounded but still irregular uh, atomized, which might result maybe from water type um, um, atomization. When you have angular features um, such as uh, these ones, they could be from mechanical disintegration, such as a cast and crush, where an ingot is cast and then is crushed in jaws. Um, so you get a resulting angular um, features um, on the particles. Um, more irregular uh, from sometimes of atomization and chemical deposition. Um, and these three dimensional shapes are simplified slightly here. So you can see uh, some different morphologies, the spherical, uh, rounded, uh, cylindrical, spongy, flaky, acicular, cubic, and aggregated here. So each particle can be uh, simplified, and this is uh, often the case, which is used by ways of uh, counting or finding power to size distributions from uh, average. And the particle can be simplified. Um, there are certain uh, aspect, uh, certain um, values which can be determined from uh, setting an equivalent uh, spherical shape, but um, Height to width is the aspect ratio, for example. Uh, we have projected areas, um, and we will use the equivalent spherical diameters often to compute um, potentially the overall volume and mass of powders and density of powders based upon approximation of single particles. There are many different ways of measuring powder sizes. Some of the um, ranges of um, powder size distribution, which can be measured by different methods, are shown in this chart. Um, at the higher level, coarsest level, so anything up to between uh, 10 microns, right the way up to um, uh, almost 100 millimeters can be done by dry sieving. In fact, that's, that's uh, 30 microns is about the cutoff limit there of dry sieving. And um, we can use image analysis, and there are automated ways of doing this. By wet sieving, we can bring down the lower limit, um, and we'll typically use wet sieving when we're going down to um, below 20, 10, 20 micron, up to um, about um, five millimeters. Um, there are, there's different types of sealing methods and photo-optical methods, which quite, cover quite a wide range. The laser diffraction methods here are probably the most industry standard at the moment, and these cover typically a very wide range and down to a very small size um, of uh, particle, uh, sort of almost down to uh, one micron. Um, and then we can use other types of um, um, microscope-based uh, image analysis which has been automated to determine even smaller size um, particles. The simplest way uh, to determine the powder size distribution comes from uh, putting powder through sieves. So again, just to remind you that PSD stands for powder, uh, we can stand for particle size distributions uh, or powder sieve distributions. Um, there are standards 
uh, which uh, relate to the uh, to the mesh sizes. And so here are here is a three mesh, and there is a six mesh, and um, that's based on the U.S. standard size sieve mesh size. Um, so if we were to go finer than that, um, we would have um, sieve mesh sizes going down from 14 uh, down to 28, which would capture um, uh, 700 microns sort of sand uh, size. A fine size of 250 micron would be caught by a 60 micron mesh. Um, and we would then go down and be able to go down to, with certain types of mesh, going down below 74 to 44 microns to 37 microns. At that point there, it's very difficult to only do dry sieving, so you have to do wet sieving to capture sort of um, sub 37 micron size. But that's typically done in one of the vibratory sieves, uh, like this RC tap, where the sieves are located one above each other, each with a different size fraction. The powder is put in at the top, and it vibrates and the smaller powder falls down into the smallest uh, to the collection um, below the collection sieve here into, into the pot there. Each of the sieves are then removed and then they're weighed up. And the weighing can be done on, uh, on quite precision based weighing scales and here you can see an example of how the different sieves have trapped different weight percentages of the total weight um, and with that you can plot up a cumulative size distribution um, and you can see two types of distribution you can have a normal distribution like so or you can have the cumulative distribution there okay so powders can be non-symmetric the distributions can uh, are gaussian shaped but they can be non-symmetric or symmetric um, most of what we deal with at the moment are pretty much symmetric size distributions, but you can see there the, how the mode, the median and the mean is defined on a non-symmetric Gaussian distribution and how the same median is, co is covered for a symmetric distribution. And what we're going to learn about now is what these quantities DV0.1, DV0.5 and DV0.9 mean. Here are some uh, uh, laser diffraction uh, distributions of powder sizes. So you can see these are for a very fine powder, which is uh, nano powder. And you can see a slightly non-symmetric size uh, Gaussian distribution um, with a modal diameter indicated there of about eight and a half, uh, a mean diameter of just above 10 nanometers there and they've got the, the full width there of the distribution of 8.4. So exactly the same uh, distribution can be plotted as a cumulative frequency um, and this is called the cumulative distribution and on this again you can see uh, how it goes up from 0 to 100%. So the way in which the um, powder size distributions can be uh, calculated, well, um, is either through the number or an approximation of the area or the volume of the particles within um, a certain amount. You can see here the correlation with counting. If you have a fixed number of uh, peas, beans, and beans of different sizes, the, they will fill up a volume uh, in different ways, depending on the number. Typically, what we use um, is the volume-based uh, distribution. So the medium is the most typical form of describing the powder in industry, and the usual underlying basis is the volume, but often abbreviated to D. So typically, um, we use the D10 or DV 0.1. Okay, so. This, the median is defined as a size beyond which a certain amount of population resides, denoted by the capital D. It can be expressed in terms of the number DN50, um, or by surface area, by DS50, but the typical one which is used is DV50. Okay, so the, the 50 in this example represents the percentage of the population, i.e. 50 percent. So going back to that nano powder uh, distribution, we can see that the, uh, the 10, at the 10, at the 50 percent here, um, most 
50% uh, of the population of particles in the distribution are below the nine and a half nanometers there. All right, so it always comes, it's the number of particles below, and the D90 here is 16.2 nanometers there, and it means that 90% uh, of the particles are smaller than the 16.2 nanometers. But let's look at a slightly larger powder, which is more equivalent to what is used in additive manufacturing. This is from a paper by Tan et al. from 2017. So they show that this particular powder has a slightly non-symmetric Gaussian distribution. So it has a mode, median, and mean. But the cumulative distribution looks like the one on the right. And here we can see that 10% um, of the particles are below uh, the 20 micron. We can see that 50% of the particles are below 45 micron, and 90% of the particles are below the 60 micron size. Right, so that was the powder size distributions. Now, let's talk about density. So the true density of a powder is the density of the exact same alloy composition in its solid state. Okay? So that is if you were to measure the density of one single particle, and we assume a homogeneous composition of that particle, then that is the true density of the powder. But powder comes in different sizes, and when the, and the powder settles, there are interstitial vo voids between the powders. So um, on the basis of that, we have the apparent density, yeah, which is the mass of a unit of volume of loose powder, Okay, and it's important because it determines the size of the dyes required to come out of the loose powder prior to compaction. Okay, in a compaction problem. Okay, so the, um, it's important throughout various powder metallurgy because in the way you just put the powder in, that is the apparent density. Um, I'm going to show you in a minute now how apparent density is measured. Um, the other type uh, of density which we refer to when we're talking about powders is the tap density. Okay, so these are all in grams per cubic centimeters. The tap density is measured after tapping the powder a few times, okay, and the tap density is always greater than the apparent density, okay, and it will be influenced by properties of the powder, such as size distributions. So if small particles of powder accumulate between larger particles, they will fill up the interstitial voids and you will end up with a much more tightly packed powder when it's tapped. Um, Okay, the morphology, if those powder particles are um, high in aspect ratio, then they will um, tend to keep more voids and therefore the tap density will be low, lower. Okay, so the packing factor is another thing that we uh, refer to. Okay, and that's the apparent density, which is the, um, the powder as if you just put it into a flask and the true density of the material. So um, obviously uh, the, the lower, um, the uh, apparent density divided by true density, so the higher the apparent density, the um, uh, closer you are to true density. So this is the value between naught and one. And it depends, uh, the packing um, factor, uh, packing density depends very much upon how the, uh, how the par particles are um, packed. So you actually get a relatively low um, um, packing factor if all the spheres are monosized. If you have a distribution of particles, you can actually get a much a maximum packing factor by filling the uh, locations uh, between the large particles with smaller particles. And we have a relatively dense part here because of that with the, with relatively low voids and then we go to the other extreme we have lots of small particles and then in that case uh, our packing density will drop down so these are relatively simple um, experiments that can be done with powders uh, using uh, a Hall flow meter and this is part of the uh, standard way for testing for obtaining these values now, the flow rate um, and the apparent density can be obtained from the same experiment using a uh, Hall flow meter funnel, which is uh, shown on the right-hand side there. 
Okay, and the flow rate is taken by measuring the time that it takes to put 50 grams of the powder to flow through this calibrated hall flow meter uh, with a standard uh, funnel orifice of, different, of uh, about um, 2.5 millimeters. Okay, so this is, uh, it's both ASTM but also international standards. Um, and apparent density can be done by obtaining a volume of a certain quantity of powder in a loose condition to flow through the funnel into a specified cup. And then we measure the weight of the cup with the powder in it. Um, and that gives us then the apparent density. It's a very simple experiment. But the measure, and these are some of the um, effects of the morphology itself upon um, the, the um, apparent density. So um, dendritic powders have the lowest apparent density and spherical powders will uh, have higher um, apparent density. Okay, so these have a higher packing uh, density, so therefore they end up with an increased apparent density. And what we can see here on the right-hand side are more effects of the morphology. So these are theoretical estimates of um, the mass flow rate as a function of the aspect ratio. So you can see that as the aspect ratio of particles, and I think on the left here, we, we've got um, uh, for um, ellipses of increasing aspect ratio. So the aspect ratio of one is essentially a circle. So you can see down uh, on this other paper here what happens. Um, as we uh, increase the aspect ratio towards one, we also increase the flow rate. So they flow better. Okay, so these are saying that the low aspect ratio, which is this one here, uh, with the, um, um, this is the low aspect ratio, and this is the high aspect ratio of one. And this is the 0.2. And you can see that as we um, increase the aspect ratio, we get more towards one, i.e. A, towards from, a, from an ellipse to a circle, and that include, improves the flow rate of the powder through the funnel. Okay, so particle sizes also have an effect. So as we increase our particle sizes, we do get an increase in apparent density, okay, or vice versa, uh, a decrease in the um, size of the particles causes a decrease in the apparent density. Um, but as we can also, we can increase the density as our particle size goes up, but as our particle size goes up, then our flow rate comes down. So this shows two uh, opposing constraints of powders. Um, so whereas we might want to have a powder that flows well, in that case, we want to increase the size of the powder, but if we wanted to pack well, then we actually need to decrease the size of the powder particles. So how do the powder size distributions relate back to that? Well, through trial and error, powder particle sizes of 15 to 45 microns have been established to work the best with optical-based powder bed systems, such as selective laser melting or powder bed laser fusion. Okay, so here we are. We have 15 on this side and 45 on that side. Blown powder and, and electron beam uh, meth processes work with larger size distributions. So with the E-beam, uh, we are in the 50 to 150 micron, and more specifically, around about 50 to about 110. Now, the blown powder uses even larger size powders, uh, powder sizes, okay? And these will also be in the 50 to 170 micron, 50 micron size. And a lot of this is related to the heat source, sources used. So as you know, the, um, and we've talked about this before, the laser sizes, uh, um, optical lasers, which are in the sort of one micron band, which are typically terbium fiber, will have beam sizes of the sort of 50 to maximum 150 micron. Um, now, E-beam uh, is not actually a laser, sorry, that's uh, the electron beam uh, heat source, um, will typically have a, a slightly larger spot size, and that allows them to melt slightly larger particles. 
And those used in direct metal main position or laser cladding systems can be much larger yet again, so with up to one to two millimeter um, spot sizes. Okay, so what are the effects? Another another effect here now we have is the powder size distribution on surface roughness. So this is from a series of paper by Spearings and his colleagues uh, in uh, rapid prototyping and also in the solid freeform fabrication symposium. And they take um, three, three different um, uh, 316 stainless steel powders with different size distributions. So you can see a relatively fine one there with a D10 size of seven micron D50 size 15 micron and a D90 size of 24 micron. So this is a much finer uh, um, 316 than would normally be used. Um, a more typical size here is their type 2 powder uh, in which uh, the uh, D10 size is 19 micron, D50 size is 28 and the D90 is 41. And then another um, type of powder here, which is also meant to be 316, so I think this is a typo, um, but here they have a, a D10 size of 15 micron, and a um, D50 size 37 micron, and a D90 55 micron. So in essence, all powder particles, 90% of the powder particles in the in these are below 55, 41, and 24 micron respectively. And what we can see here are two different build uh, layer thicknesses that they test um, their their assumptions on. Um, there is on a 30 micron build layer thickness, and then another one where they use a 45 micron. In both cases, the, um, the, the parts have been sand blasted, so that we're not looking at the effects of sintered particle on the surface roughness, but rather we're looking at the um, sort of polished part uh, or sand blasted part. Um, and as you can see, there is an effect. So the finer the um, particle, the lower the surface roughness. So um, and that being generally the case um, across a range of different um, um, particles with, um, you know, as much difference as about four micron um, surface roughness there. With the, um, with the larger layer thickness, those differences are still there, but not quite as apparent. Okay, so that was the effect which powder size distributions had on surface roughness. Here's another effect which has been, is, um, I'm showing some predicted results, which shows that what is, uh, if you start with a uh, low packing density, you, uh, you can end up with um, uh, quite a lot of balling. Um, so what we have is on the lower part of this uh, simulation, you have a 45 density, you see a relatively good uh, thorough melt of the particles so there's uh, um, a good finish um, in terms of the height of the melt whereas on the top one where we have the lower starting packing density we see that um, in these regions here uh, the, the melt is broken down which has resulted in a uneven uh, height of the melt track so just to quickly conclude this, now it's only meant to be a short lecture, we've seen that there are various ways of obtaining powder size distributions from sieving through to laser diffraction and other methods. So the laser diffraction methods are those provided by systems such as the Malvern 2000 are pretty much industry standards. Uh, we've seen that um, powders can take on, uh, powder particles come in a wide range of uh, different morphologies, fascicular, spongy, flaky, dendritic, spherical, rounded, irregular, angular, and porous. Okay. Um, we can characterize the powder also by the dimensional attributes of the particles, such as aspect ratio. Physical properties such as tap density and apparent density, which we've had a quick introduction to. And rheometry of the powders. So um, uh, in addition to the density, we can also look at uh, indices such as Hall flow to uh, characterize how the um, uh, powders will flow. It's important for additive manufacturing uh, processes to have correctly sized powders, um, and uh, the correct sizes are related to the, uh, to the heat sources used. We've learned that finer powders are required for uh, laser powder bed fusion systems, uh, typically in the 15 to 45 micron range. 
uh, with distributions such as D10 equals 20 micron, or D50 or 30 micron, or D90 or 50 micron. Uh, we've also uh, learned that medium fine powders are used for the EBM processes, ranging from 50 to 150 micron, with a typical distribution given by uh, D10 equals 51 micron, D50 equals 72 micron, and the D90 at 190 micron, 109 micron, sorry. For, the, for blown powder or laser cladding systems, um, the coarsest powder, coarser powders are used uh, with uh, powder size distributions in the range of 50 to 170. 70 micron. Um, we've seen that powder characteristics can have a strong influence on the final mechanical properties of AM parts, ranging from density, surface roughness, and tensile properties. Now, specifically for the powder bed processes, the powder needs to be able to flow, and spherical powders produced by gas or gas plasma atomization have been found to be best. The powder needs to have a high packing um, factor, and more fine particles can increase packing by filling interstitial voids, ultimately leading to um, a denser built part. Too many fine particles, on the other hand, reduce the flowability of the powder and can lead to greater variations across uh, the build plate. Fine particles increase the packing, so therefore reduce the optical penetration depth of the powder. May, this may promote conductive melting, um, but it also um, may mean that um, there are problems with um, the continuity of the tracks, but too many coarse powders are uh, difficult to melt and decrease the optical penetration depth and could lead to keyholing as the laser penetrates the substrate easier. That concludes um, this lecture, uh, E-Lecture 6, and um, I'd encourage you to have a go at uh, the test 6 and 7 later on for the um, uh, powder production process and powder feedstock. All the best.